All right, guys. Welcome. This is Sam and Chris from Crimson Creed, a new Facebook page focusing on Oklahoma Sooner football, uh, greatest college football team in the country, greatest fan base in the country. I am Sam, lifelong OU fan, OU graduate. With me, I do have my brother, Chris. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. And I am Chris. I also a lifetime, lifelong OU football fan, graduate of the university, and love putting together some good YouTube videos and love just following the team. Cool. Cool. Yeah. If you guys haven't checked out Chris's YouTube page yet, his channel, um, he does put videos of the OU football games on there with the OU radio calls dubbed over them, matched up, synced up perfectly. Uh, so it's a good way to recap it, hear the excitement, relive it. Uh, definitely go give that a check. There's a link to it in our Facebook page. Again, that is Crimson Creed. I um, want to start off by talking through our favorite Oklahoma football victories of our lifetime. Uh, you know, we're both in our 20s, so there's a bit of recency bias with it. Um, you know, we're going to be giving ours here, but we do want to hear from you guys in the comments on this, um, in messages, maybe posts on the group page, however you want to interact with us. Let us know what the best OU win is that you've had in your lifetime. Um, I know we're going to have some people here got to witness uh, some of the great wins with the Selman brothers, um, you know, the wishbone, all those sorts of things through the 70s and 80s. And then we'll have some people who have been you know, more privy to the last 10, 15 years worth of games. Um, Chris, what's your favorite OU victory of all time? You know, before this year, it was that win against Ohio State and Columbus, especially after what they did to us in 2016, the way we just went there and dominated them with Baker Mayfield and in 2017 and the way that we had a beaten up team, but we still beat them in the next month. But after that OU Texas game this year, I don't know how I couldn't say OU Texas being down 28 to seven in the first quarter and seeing Caleb Williams come in and his first ever snap in OU Texas history runs it for a long touchdown. I think it was 66 yards and he just, he dominated that football game for the offense. And, you know, I love some good offensive football. And so I, I've got to say OU Texas. What about you? Yeah. Um, I've definitely got to go the, you know, I guess it's a combo offensive and defensive route, really a defensive showcase from the guys. Uh, OU 77 to nothing victory over Texas A&M, uh, you know, early 2000s. I believe that was 2003. Um, you know, they walk in there, the Aggies do, and, you know, they think they're going to be playing ball. Uh, they give up 11 touchdowns. Definitely not what you want to do if you're the fighting Aggies, but... You know, we dominated that game, both sides of the ball. That was definitely our uh, peak defensive era um, in the modern modern era, at least. And, you know, on that line, I think it brings us kind of to Brent Venables now, um, leading us back into some of that, taking us back to the peak defense that OU was so well known for, you know, with all the Broyles Award um Jim Thorpe Award candidates, excuse me, that we had through the early 2000s. Um, really just a great group. Um, but, you know, leading kind of into the stuff this year and the stuff we have to come, the most immediate future is on uh, the OU-Oregon Alamo Bowl matchup. Um, OU has opened that one as a four-and-a-half-point favorite, and – we just want to talk through a little bit kind of how those uh, teams are going to stack up against one another. Headed. Uh, so Oklahoma right now averaging 38 and a half points per game. Just a little shy of 450 yards per game. Uh, not too shabby at all there. Chris, how's Oregon looking? They're looking, they're looking all right. So their offensive it's kind of come and go this year. So they're averaging 31.4 points per game, which is a whole touchdown less than OU, but they're only averaging what, like 23 yards per game less at 418 yards per game. And they've been very balanced on that offensive side of the ball. They averaged 214 yards 
uh, per game on the uh, through the air and 203 yards per game on the ground. So they if you can't if they can't get you through the air, they're going to get you with the ground attack. Yep, that's a good summary of it. I think you know you can't go wrong with balance. Um, I think one of the strengths for OU this year has been the air game that we were able to find for a portion of the season with Caleb Williams um, from the Texas game forward. I know late in the year, obviously, uh, you know, there's maybe a couple things you could attribute to some of the decline in production there through those last couple games of the year, Um, mainly a certain individual who is out in the uh, gold scavenging areas of the country now (laughs) going out there, taking our, Taking our staff, taking our recruits, um, won't mention his name here, but for the most part, Caleb Williams this year, really solid passer, um, did a lot of good for us, bringing us, you know, 265 yards through the air per game on average, um, nothing to sneeze at, um, you know, one of our strengths I think was that, um, far as maybe a weakness for Oklahoma this year, we've definitely had some trouble controlling the line of scrimmage on both sides. Um, As the year went on, you know, especially the Iowa State game, we got to see this, you know, the combination of Nick Benito and Isaiah Thomas and Perrion Winfrey on our defensive line. Um, They're monsters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And controlling that defensive line of scrimmage a little more. Uh, The offensive line had some struggles. Um, I I think you would agree with me there. We definitely saw maybe a little less production this year out of our offensive line than we're used to seeing in this era. You know, something that, uh, something that got brought up to me a while back is Bill Biedenboe, our offensive line coach. He, he does not like to hype up his players. He likes to just let their work speak for itself. And coming into this year, he talked about how this might be the best offensive line that we've ever had, including that 2017 offensive line that was so dominant. And if you remember, Mm -hmm. our offense was not the problem against Georgia that year, but they were just, they were so wildly inconsistent this year. So like, look at the, look at the Texas and the TCU games, for example, we, we dominated the line of scrimmage, uh, in that game, especially on the offense and the def on the defensive side, we waited till the second half, and then you get games like against Baylor and Oklahoma State and Iowa State where we could barely move the ball. So they they were good in some portions, but it's definitely a weakness. Something that something that's definitely a big weakness for Oregon right now is their offensive inconsistency as a whole. So like they went in against Ohio State this year, who had a really good defense. If as the year progressed, I think when they went up against Michigan, they had like a top five defense. This was the same offense that uh, put up 35 points on Ohio State. They they put up 52 on Colorado. They put up 38 on Washington State. They put up a combined 17 points in their two matchups against uh, against Oregon. So while they do have a uh, – not Oregon, uh, against Utah, excuse me. But while they do have a really balanced offensive attack, when they hit a slump, they hit a slump hard. Yep, for sure. Um, definitely looking forward to seeing how the two teams kind of stack up, see if the four and a half point line holds. Um, you know, one of the things that's going to play a role in this game is the opt outs that we have. Uh, so, you know, one thing we've seen definitely a lot more of in the age of the um, really the focus on putting yourself in the best position possible to get to the NFL in one piece, one non injured piece. Um, The idea for players has been opting out of bowl games if it's not a game that that you would necessarily consider meaningful, um, such as a playoff game or maybe if your team's not frequently in a New Year's Six Bowl. um, Those are maybe considered to be more meaningful games for those guys. Um, We've kind of seen that hold true in this one. Several players opting out of this Alamo Bowl, maybe not seeing it as a high value game, which, you know, I. I I can agree with them there a little bit. Going to definitely not say this is our most high value bowl game ever. Um, but that said, we definitely are losing some production here. Um, so one of those opt outs, you know, 
each team has had one really noteworthy one, at least from the defensive side of the ball. Uh, obviously, Oklahoma's had a couple of them. Uh, one I want to focus on at this moment is Mr. Nick Benito. Um, you know, one of the most consistently solid players that we've had over the last couple seasons. Um, he's been a fixture there on our defense, making plays from the defensive line, making plays in the secondary, as you may remember in the 28 to three comeback win over Baylor, um, making that game ceiling interception. Um, you know, he's, he's just really solid this year, pulling in seven sacks through the season. Um, no interceptions this time, but you know, he had 39 tackles. That's second most that he's had in a season in his uh, career at OU dating back to 2018. Um, 23 of those being solo tackles. He did have one forced fumble this year. So overall, I mean, a pretty solidly productive player. Um, who do you have on the Oklahoma offense that's going to be maybe the X factor that's opted out? When it comes to the X factor that's opted out for our offense, have have we had any major offense? It, it, we've had some guys enter the transfer portal, like, one guy that I've been high on for a while is Jaden Hazelwood, who oh, yeah. maybe didn't play like the number one receiver in his class, but he he received more passes than anybody, and he showed an ability this year to catch almost anything that went his way. And Absolutely. not only did he not play for the Alamo Bowl, he's with Arkansas now. So that's that's a pretty big loss on the offense for us. He's an unsung hero, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. Um, the other one I know here is Theo Weiss. Uh, you know, Weiss was obviously in the transfer portal for a minute. We hired Venables, hired Jeff Levy. Um, and I think some of the internal noise that's been going that, you know, it's looking like Caleb Williams is probably going to be staying and playing ball under Venables and Levy. Um, Weiss obviously pulled his name out of the transfer portal. Uh, he is not going to be playing in this bowl game uh, because of that. He's I, I don't know that he's. Not totally sure if it's an NCAA eligibility thing, pulling out of the transfer portal and then not being able to play immediately, or if maybe this just is something he was doing. Um, not positive there, but in any case, he's not going to be playing. So definitely the wide receiver room's losing a little depth there. I'd imagine it has something to do with Bob Stoops coming, because like right when Bob Stoops came in is when he entered the transfer portal. And, and then by the time he comes back, we're... We're like a week and a half away from the bowl game. This offense has already had its new system put into place, and they're working on perfecting it. I don't know if he knows anything about the system. It might be the same system we've been running. It might be drastically different. So it might be an eligibility thing, or it'll be something where, like, he doesn't know the plays. And kind of like OBJ, when he started immediately playing for the Rams, he didn't know what he was doing out there for the first few games. And it, mm -hmm. it could just be something like that, too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from my understanding, the uh, you know the system we're running in this bowl game is going to be pretty much what the players have had. It's going to be some of uh, some of the system from the old man out west. Um, you know, I, I know Stoops is wanting to drive consistency with these guys as much as possible going into a bowl game with an interim coach. So having Kale Gundy in there, um, having a couple of the guys, I know. Uh, Brian Odom, for example, coming back, coaching through the bowl game. They're trying to just stick with what they know at this point, get them through and try to close out the season on a good note with a win. Um, you know, on the continuing that subject of opt outs, Oregon obviously has had a huge opt out. Uh, mm -hmm. The guy who was considered by some, you know, it, it was kind of a mix between Spencer Rattler and this guy, Kayvon Thibodeau, a defensive lineman for Oregon, um, analysts nationwide were kind of split on which one of them was really the preseason number one draft pick um, coming into the year. Thibodeau obviously sidelined for some of the season with injuries. Rattler sidelined for um, sidelined in favor of Caleb Williams. So. Uh, some stuff there, but Thibodeau, obviously a key guy for Oregon, um, huge player, 35 solo tackles this year, uh, seven sacks, same as Nick Benito. He had a couple of fumbles this year that he was able to force. 
just a really solid, uh, solid defensive end, big guy, six five, two fifty eight. Um, you know, he's got three seasons now under his belt at Oregon. Um, what kind of, what kind of effect do you see those two defensive absences having on the battles at the line of scrimmage in this game? You see, not to not to let my Oklahoma bias come out, but I think all those are really going to kind of favor Oklahoma because because Oregon's defense, that defensive line, it's Kayvon Thibodeau and then it's everyone else. You lose Kayvon Thibodeau, you lose a big part of your defense. Now, of course, they had a pretty good defensive showing against Ohio State, and Kayvon Thibodeau was not in that game. He was injured, so he was in a T-shirt the whole game. But, but – Regardless of that, he is their main guy on defense. And when you take away your main guy like that, you lose a lot. Now, of course, we lost our entire defensive line. I think Jalen Redmond's staying with us for probably another season. But we lost Nick Benito. We lost Isaiah Thomas. We lost Perry on Winfrey. But at the same time, the guys who are replacing them are proven playmakers. Like we've got Reggie Grimes coming in there who this week said he'd run through a brick wall for Venables. We've got Isaiah Coe coming in there. We've got uh, we've got some of our true freshmen like the standout Ethan Downs who's had such a good year. We're going to get to see a lot of guys who on our team who have had good experience and then Oregon lose their best defensive playmaker. I think a lot of this is going to favor Oklahoma in this game. Yeah. I think that's fair Um, question for you on what you said there. Do you think there is anybody in Sooner Nation right now, fan wise, player wise, anybody that would not jump up and barrel right through a brick wall for BV at this moment? Because I'm having trouble coming up with anyone. I mean, I'm I'm about ready to put the pads on and run through there myself at this point. He's a he's a bad dude. The only guy I know in this state who might not be ready to do that is uh, due to about a mi- about an hour and a half northeast of here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mike Gundy. But other than that, no, he he and Bob Stoops both. I remember that speech Bob Stoops gave the day after the the guy in the West quit. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, he took another job. Uh, that speech had had some former players ready to suit up and get out there, even though they're 80 years old. And then Brent Venables comes in here and he wins the fan base over in five minutes and he starts recruiting day one. His first recruiting trip was to Caleb Williams. That's the first person he met with. And he's just, he's really inspired these guys with these, this crew he comes in for. Uh, you know how out of shape I am. I would be happy to pad up and just run through a wall for him. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, who do you have spotlighted on the offensive side of the ball? I talked a little bit through defense, obviously, with Kayvon and Nick Benito. Uh, who do you have looking at on the offensive side of the ball for this game? So for for both sides, I'm going to go with the most important player on the team, and that's the quarterback. Because like, on our offense, you've got guys like Kennedy Brooks. You've got Eric Gray. You've got Marvin Mims. You've got these guys who are proven playmakers. But we've seen how we've seen how little – some of the receivers can do whenever Caleb Williams is not on his game. So like against Texas, Caleb Williams had an absolute monster of a game, 16 of 25 for 212 yards uh, and two touchdowns, no interceptions, including a 52 yard touchdown pass to Marvin Mims. He, he went 18 of 23 for 295 against TCU with it, He's had nothing but long touchdown runs this year. Then you put him up against Baylor and Iowa state. Where in that game, in those two games combined, he threw for 17 out of 36, and not even not even a total of 250 yards in those games combined. And so, consistency from him, both on the ground and through the air, will be huge. And something that a lot of guys forget about this uh, about this Oregon quarterback, Anthony Brown, he was the guy that Justin Herbert took over for. Anthony Brown, he was the guy in 2017 for Oregon. Actually, no, I forgot. He was a he was at Boston College. He didn't come in until last year. I forgot about that. But either way, he's been in college football a long time. He was in college football when Baker Mayfield was playing for OU and won the Heisman. Something that'll be big for him is if he can show that experience. If he shows that experience, if he if he gets the ball around, he he doesn't just focus on one guy, but lets the whole offense have it he uses his arms just as much as he uses his feet 
he has the chance of really making a difference in this game, but we also saw how inconsistent he could be. Now, while he threw for 15 touchdowns this year, he also threw six interceptions. While Caleb Williams only playing, uh, only playing what, like six and a half games, threw 18 mm-hmm. touchdown passes and only four interceptions. And how many of those touchdown runs of his were at least 40 or 50 yards? I mean, he these two quarterbacks are going to be the difference makers in the game. Kennedy Brooks, we know is going to be consistent. He's going to end the game with four or five yards of carry Marvin Mims. He's going to catch the balls that are thrown his way. The Oregon backfield, they are going to continue to run the ball. Well, what is going to be the main difference maker is how well do the quarterbacks themselves play? Yeah, I like that. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head with Caleb Williams needing to just find consistency on the ground through the air and really leverage the talent that he does have. Um, almost feels like it was stifled a little bit, mm-hmm. maybe by game plan, by coaching um, in that very last quarter of the season. Um, so I'm excited to see what Stoops brings out of him, uh, if anything, here. Overall prediction on the game, I think I'm laying on 38-31 in favor of OU. Um, you know, the losses on defense for both teams, I think it's going to create more of a um, more of a focus on the defensive secondaries. And, you know, Utah torching Oregon, OU getting uh, burned at points this year in the secondary. You know, I think we've I think we've got the potential for a decently high scoring game, not a total barn burner. Um, but Oklahoma pulls it out 38, 31. I can definitely see that. Uh, I think I think it's going to be around that area. I think the kickers are also going to come in big here. Maybe Gabe Burkett will kind of get his rhythm back. I I could see us winning. I'd say either 34 to 24, or if our offense can find its rhythm, especially with the game management skills of Bob Stoops, we're gonna we're gonna win like 41 to. Uh, 41 to 20 is a very real possibility. It could end up being a low scoring close game, but when you look at when you look at how our guys have played, we have done a lot more through a lot less chances. So like for example, Kennedy Brooks, he has carried the ball nine fewer times than uh than the Oregon running back and let's see here, I can't remember his name is Travis Dye. Uh he's carried the ball nine fewer times and only has uh and only has seven fewer yards. Uh, Marvin Mims, he has five fewer receptions than the than the leading Oregon receiver in Davon Williams. Yet with five fewer receptions, he has almost a hundred more yards and the same amount of touchdowns. And like I mentioned a minute ago, Caleb Williams, he's played half the time that Anthony Brown has this year, but he has three more touchdowns and two fewer interceptions. So because we do so much more with each chance that we get. I'm I'm gonna say Oklahoma has the chance to either win a close game or blow them out of the water. I don't I don't see us losing this game. I like I like it. Um, well, that's kind of the look at OU Oregon. Um, you know, as we progress through kind of building this Facebook group, through building a following here, uh, just some things to put out there you know chris and i you know we haven't played uh haven't played football at the collegiate level we are lifelong dedicated fans of the oklahoma sooners we kind of approach things through a a stat-based analysis to an extent you know there's some intangibles that you don't have to have played football to be able to pick up but um we do want to be able to hear from everybody that supports us that watches this uh you know, that watches this, follows our page. So if you have insights to offer there, please shoot those to us in a message. Um, you know, comment them, post them, whatever. We do want to hear from you guys. Uh, we are going to be doing more of these, um, more of these little broadcasts. These, they're, I guess they're kind of like podcasts, really. Um, mm-hmm. But we're going to be doing a lot more of these. So the next one, it's going to be a recap on OU's uh, matchup against Oregon. See how it went. See if our predictions came out right. Um, you know, you never know. We'll be looking at some of the bowl games that have taken place. I don't know that we'll have had too many exciting ones by the time OU plays. Maybe a couple. The real good ones, obviously, are going to be on the 31st. Um, and, you know, as we go through the offseason, we'll be doing these about once every couple of weeks. 
uh, every couple, maybe three weeks. And one of the fixtures of that is going to be a recruit spotlight, taking a look at one recruit that OU has nailed down or maybe that was previously committed and, you know, just kind of looking at an update, maybe seeing what they're going to bring for the upcoming season. Um, so it's it's going to be a good time. We look forward to having you guys on the ride here with us. Um, give us your feedback. Give us your thoughts on you know OU on the show, whatever you like. Um, as we go along, we we want to hear from you guys. Want to make sure this is a good interactive space for the fan base. Um, Chris, anything to add here before we close this one out? No, I, you summed it up pretty well. Uh, just make sure that if y'all like our page. Tell your friends about it. Tell your family about it. Pull up the page while uh, while the game's going on and uh, comment on our post. We can have a we can have a game feed going. Just let us know what would make this page more enjoyable for you, and and we'll see what we can do to we'll see what we can do to make this the best OU football page on Facebook. All right, cool. Well, to everyone listening to this, uh, you know, this evening, Saturday evening. Hope you have a good night. Everybody else, enjoy your morning, your afternoon, your day, wherever, whenever you're listening to this. We look forward to joining you all soon. Again, this is Sam and Chris from Crimson Creed. We will talk to you guys again soon.